What started with a will reading was leading to chaos where it involved butlers and gangsters fighting each other with the damned dozen right in the middle. After this second group of dead rabbits was taken out, Dante then observed Heathcliff digging through their pockets and wanted to know what he was looking for. He then said that they didn't have them. Dante was quick to figure out that he meant the timepieces that Yi Sang mentioned earlier. Heathcliff confer well, confirmed this. Yes, everyone born and raised in District 20 carried a watch. It was mandatory. Even the Kurokumo clan had them, like the captain of that syndicate in the building where the monolith was. Along with the imprisoned distortion bamboo-hatted Kim of the blade lineage. It wasn't just the wallet where you're paid and charged in time. It was also personal ID. He threw, he threw his watch away when he left District 20. Nelly found that they didn't even have pocket watch chains on them. If they did carry a watch, they'd be able to know where they came from before the fates that they eventually had had occurred. Roger deduced that someone either didn't want people finding out who they were or weren't from around there. Yi Sang could tell that they were locals based on their attire, which is defined like by, well, it was defined by looking like you're from Victorian Britain. Rotis saw that there was many unanswered questions, but saw it as a matter for another time. Heathcliff then found the right room. Nene thought it was quite the journey, asking if they should enter. Before they did, Heathcliff asked Nelly, after he left without a word, how did Catherine fare? Nelly was hesitant to answer. Heathcliff knew that she lived happily ever after with Linton, but Nelly asked if he sure that he wanted to know. He was conflicted and made it clear he was unsure if he did want to know. He saw himself as looking pathetic. If Kathy was there, she would have mocked him mercilessly. Yeah, in reality, being a cinder will blow up in your face, as the one on the receiving end of that treatment would do all that they could to avoid you. Anyway, Nelly would have brought him a mirror to show him the priceless look on his face if she hadn't removed them all, laughing at the thought. Heathcliff didn't give a f about this. He wanted to know if Catherine mentioned his name at all since he left. Nelly said no. Heathcliff didn't like this answer, but he understood why. Seeing himself as a witless brigand a scoundrel like him. He didn't think that it mattered to Catherine whether he lived or died. Nelly wasn't so sure. It wasn't what she meant. When he left, she began to wither away. She was in her room for days, refusing to eat or even speak. Then she was screaming, crying, whispering things to herself starting to lose herself in both body and mind. Linton tried to coax her, but that hardly helped. She was so ill. Nelly worried that they might have had to book a plot in the cemetery and get a mortician before she was dead. This surprised Heathcliff that she was in so much pain, and it pained him to, as well to see her suffer. Then one day she... Then we received a flashback 
of when she told Nelly that Linton left a flower on her pillow. It was golden. Not knowing that spring had come to Wuthering Heights, the snow had fallen. Nelly asked if that was not romantic of him. Kathy saw it as looking that way. He had to have paid a fortune for that. But if he truly cared about her, and truly wished to return a colour to a flower for her sake, then he should have brought her a violet flower. Nelly was silent at this. Kathy then went on to say that Linton didn't bring that flower for her sake, it was for his own satisfaction. Nelly asked if she was okay. Kathy apparently never felt better than she did that day. She then asked Nelly to walk with her. She wished to see which flowers had weathered the wintry cold and bloomed. Then we got back to the present, and Nelly told Heathcliff that after that day she appeared convalescent. They were happy that she was herself again, but she thought that it was strange that she suffered for months and months for months from fever, and yet she recovered virtually overnight. It's also when she purchased Wuthering Heights from Hindley and started making sweeping modifications to that place. She thought that they intended to return there. When she asked what they intended to do with it, they didn't give her a straight answer. She didn't have a clue regarding what she was thinking. Heathcliff then asked about the letters that he sent. He sent her letters up until he joined Limbus Company. Sometime after he left the Dead Rabbits and was recruited by Limbus Company. Although he didn't sign the name, this was all to tell her that he was doing fine. Nelly didn't recall ever opening a letter. Besides, once she had her mind set on something... None could, could, well, could convince her otherwise. Hmm, I suspect that this marriage wasn't as happy as Linton made it out to be. If he didn't know what colour to bring back to a flower for Kathy. As they entered Catherine's room, they found some butlers that was already there. And Nelly was asking what they were doing. Those butlers were searching the room, now that Catherine was no longer there. They were awkwardly standing. Yes, awkwardly standing, frozen in the middle of doing something. Upon being caught. A discreet butler told her that they were cleaning the room under Lyndon's orders. Nelly wasn't fooled. They were clearly ransacking the room. A firm butler asked Nelly if she saw any of the dead rabbits or the Wuthering Heights butlers on the way there, believing that the Wuthering Heights butlers were scheming with Hindley to harm Linton. Yes, these butlers in Catherine's room were clearly loyal to Linton rather than Wuthering Heights. Heathcliff told them that the Dead Rabbits aren't the type of gang to kill people without reason. Gregor reminded him that they did try to kill them for no reason, and Heathcliff was aware of this, unsure of why Matthew was doing this. He can't be doing this for no reason. He demanded that they tell him what kind of dodgy they were doing. The discreet butler reminded Heathcliff that they were cleaning the room, Although she unwisely took a jab at him, asking if he sided with the dead rabbits. <sighs> Bad move. This gave him the impression that his butlers are as stupid and soft as Linton himself. The discreet butler saw this as uncalled for. Well, what comes around goes around. Heathcliff saw what they were doing as uncalled for, seeing it as crossing the line. 
He's the one who can tell them what to do with that room. Not that posh <laughs> This discreet butler was clearly a fool, as what she just did was pick a fight with those that were quite capable of wiping the floor with them. After they pummeled the butlers into submission, Nelly told Heathcliff to stop. The discreet butler was not in the best of shape after the beating that she received. Ishmael reminded her that they needed her alive. They need to know what they were looking for. Heathcliff demanded that she speak. He's going to take her utensils and cut off her fingers. One by one, with each dodgy answer she gives. Basically, speak plainly, or I'm going to make you suffer. He also reminded them how sharp their blades are. Nelly advised them to cooperate. She didn't want to use the sleepy smack on them. The discreet butler said the diary. Linton told them that they must find the diary in Catherine's room, that she must have hidden it somewhere in that room, as they were making modifications to the manor. Nelly asks, Why does she think Linton is looking for that diary? Apparently it was so that Linton could find a way. Nelly threatened to demonstrate how she managed to become chief butler if she maintains her mysterious attitude with more answers like that. The discreet butler told her that it was the truth. He didn't tell them what this way was. She's unable to tell them what she doesn't know herself. And just as Heathcliff was about to cut a finger, Nelly stopped him. They were telling the truth. She then told the Wuthering Heights butlers the ones loyal to Linton rather than the estate itself, to leave. The discreet butler was silent during this. As they were about to leave, Nelly added by telling them to stay out of their sight. The discreet butler told her that according to what intelligence they could gather, the dead rabbits, the syndicate of an urban plague classification, they've long been obliterated from the back street. This surprised Heathcliff, and Nelly noticed this. The discreet butler added that they've been inactive for a long, long time. Other gangs haven't seen them for a while, and there's no way to verify their identities. Advising her to be careful before she left that room. Nelly was frustrated by Hindley. What was he thinking when he let the, the dead rabbits into the manor? Then she focused her attention on what this diary meant. Dante wasn't sure what to expect from that. Ishmael told them if they do find it, it'll at least give them info on what they need to know regarding what happened there. Brutus was looking for a small container a place to hide it, thinking that it's the bookshelves or drawers, but the butlers checked those already. This excited Don Quixote as she once beheld such a sight. A hidden button must exist. They need to search the room with glasses larger than Gregor's. And Gregor argued that it's for his myopia, or nearsightedness. To put it into perspective, cats are nearsighted. That's what the whiskers are for when they're examining objects that are too close to be seen clearly. Then we have another memory where Catherine saw that there was a thousand feathers from many birds in that pillow. Apparently rare birds were collected and they stuffed the pillows with them. Catherine doesn't like that. It's because birds are meant to fly, not be killed like that. They don't belong in cages either. They were born to a sword of sky, so she'll empty that pillow of its feathers and replace them with her secrets. 
so it will always be at her arm's reach. Back in the present, Hong Lu was asking what Heathcliff was doing, tearing that pillow open. Heathcliff replied that it's where Kathy would have put it. Urutis understood that the diary was hidden within that pillow. Hong Lu saw that both the diary and the cover were themed with ink. Rodia asks why anyone would do that to their own diary. Hong Lu told her that when he would hold his pen against the paper for a long time, because he wasn't sure what to write, the ink would start to pool and spread, leaving big stains like that. Hmm, must be a quill rather than a ballpoint pen. Faust understood that the ink stains were made from a non-standard special ink, as the pool of ink might have stained that page, but it left no marks on the next page. The stains being made on purpose to hide the words under them. Ishmael understood if Lyndon was trying so hard to find that diary, then... Well, she understood that it was clearly something important. Heathcliff found that most of the pages were stained. His expression darkened, as he would have liked to read them. At that point, the pages began to suddenly flip rapidly until it came to a stop at a page with legible words. It wasn't the wind, as no windows were open. The first page that was read said, Heathcliff left me without a word. A terrible thunderstorm rages outside. Will he cease to pain my heart and return home once the rain passes, like Nelly said? Well, we know that he didn't return home, and the next page reflected her anger towards him. Fine, don't come back. I don't want to see your face ever again, ever. Clearly this anger was just the initial shock of her realising that he wasn't coming back. Yet there was hope that he would. Based on the next page. This manner and me... We're all you have. You don't have anything else. Will you truly abandon what is everything to you? Then Gregor stopped him, as this feels private, asking if they should... Sinclair wanted to leave Heathcliff alone so that he could... Then Heathcliff found an entry that seemed off. A guest paid me a visit, the first in a long time. Conversing with someone new really cleared my mind, and I saw my shape in the mirror before me. I know what to do now. The basement. We must descend there. That mirror. Hmm. That stands out, says, didn't Nelly say that she had the mirrors removed? And Sinclair asked who this we was. Nelly then spoke of the basement, asking what this had to do with this. Heathcliff told her that from what he remembers, which Nelly agreed, that's their next destination. Otis asked why she said that. And Nelly explained that Kathy's mother, who died many years ago, ordered them to seal the entrance to the basement. Heathcliff was silent as she explained this. And then they continued by saying that this means that the basement was unsealed when the modifications were made. Heathcliff asked Nelly why the basement. Kathy hated the dark, enough to keep her room always lit with several lanterns. Nelly recalled having to purchase an entire set of them whenever she left the manor to buy groceries. Brutus saw this deviation of her behaviour as suspicious. Gregor asked her where they might find the basement. Nelly remembered that it's usually by the kitchen. They needed to investigate that place next. Dante noted that they'd had a spirited start to that investigation. 
but their journey to the kitchen was far from straightforward. Melly found it odd. She thought that turning right there should have led them to the first floor. Heathcliff agreed they should have found the kitchen sooner. It made no sense for her to be lost there. Melly agreed she could navigate there blindfolded. Yi Sang sensed a familiar sensation. Ryushu completed that thought by saying that it felt like they were in a corridor. Yi Sang agreed, specifically the corridors of the back door. Faust added that considering the exterior of the mansion and comparing it to its internal map, the shape and size is far from being even remotely reasonable or in simple terms. The layout is bat crazy. Heathcliff was thinking about this, and Dante noticed this and asked what he was thinking. Heathcliff felt like this was one big riddle that Kathy used to give him. He sometimes got the right answer early. Each time she did, realized that he got it early. She kept making the answer more and more convoluted. Apparently it annoyed her when he got it right. And this is what it felt like. Like she's angered by him, hiding the basement from them, making them go in circles. Rodia was enraged, wanting to see the diary. She wants to see if anything else is said about the basement. This was the third time that they walked through the hallway. She's starting to lose it. She even recognized the picture frame. Heathcliff told her that there wasn't anything else in that diary. She wanted to look anyway. She might have missed something. Then Don Quixote overreacted. Sinclair asked if that was necessary. After a few seconds to gather her thoughts, she asked what that was. Muscle answered by saying a window shattered. Quite literally, out of nowhere. This made Roger drop the diary due to that noise. Heathcliff told her not to bother, he just needed to dust it lightly. Then he noticed something. A page that wasn't there earlier. Rodia noticed that as well. It used to be an ink stained page. It said, The basement. We must descend there. In a not so far future, I would like to hang my portrait at the entrance of that basement. A portrait of my most beautiful, most spirited, yet fleeting present self in those rare days when Josephine wasn't haunting that area of the manor. I'd sit there for hours with him by my side, just chatting out day away. Do you remember those days? Roger wanted to know the answer to this riddle. Nelly understood that only Heathcliff could solve it. He thought about where the portrait of her was hung. Then he realized that it was the fireplace in the dining hall. That's where they chatted. Hong Lu understood that those moments must have been very precious to her, certainly enough to write about them in her diary, so that she would always remember them. At that point, they had something else to be concerned about. More dead rabbits, and they weren't in the mood to talk. Heathcliff asked them where Boss was. He was answered with silence and Utis understood that communication with them was an exercise in futility. They're clearly... Heathcliff was in denial, not believing that they'd... Then he stopped himself and understood that it didn't matter what he had to say. None of this felt real. Kathy is supposedly dead, the dead rabbits have changed, and then there's that bloody maze of a manor. They then fought the dead rabbits before searching for the dining hall. They got to the fireplace, and there was already a group there. 
Linton and those butlers loyal to him. Many saw this, and Linton was expecting them to arrive there. Heathcliff didn't see this as a coincidence, understanding that Linton was also trying to enter the basement. Linton refused to answer him. Many asked him what he was hiding there, and Linton confirmed his knowledge of the basement, understanding that they got to the diary first, despite the fact that his butlers had a head start. The discreet butler apologised for this. Then Linton ordered them to return the diary to him. Rorotis asked why they must. Linton considered it reasonable for a husband to request that they return his loving wife's memento to his hands. Okay, after how you treated them worse than indentured servants and have treated Heathcliff terribly for years, you expect them to do as you want? Heathcliff certainly didn't, warning him not to provoke him. He demanded that he tell him why Catherine died, and like he said earlier, he wouldn't believe a word he said until he saw the body himself, even the claim that he married her. Linton saw this as desperate. Then he said something incredibly stupid that makes me question how he lasted that long. He offered an alternative, to go hide in some corner, wait until the lightning strikes seven times, take the golden bower and never return to that place again. Seeing it is what he does best, running away and hiding, shrouding his shameful tear-soaked face in the world, fleeing from the beating, abandoning Catherine, because he was too busy running away from the gnawing hound. Heathcliff told him to keep talking, threatening him to do so, so that he can find out that he's no longer that weak child he once knew. Then Linton demonstrated once again his lack of diplomatic skills, where he was under the impression that he had the advantage in this situation. I mean, if his butlers couldn't take them on before, why does he think that they can handle the damned dozen there? Linton wasn't sure if he's really changed since then. He then mentioned the cheap, tacky letters that he sent. They were all burned with the rest of the trash in the incinerator. It was at this point Heathcliff decided that he wasn't going to give Linton the mercy of a quick death. And he certainly wasn't going to be as forgiving towards the butlers currently protecting him this time. I can see one thing that has changed since they last met. Heathcliff is certainly more than capable of fighting back and delivering painful death when he has a reason to. As in, when he has no need to fight, well, hold back, rather. Otherwise... I suspect he would have smashed your skull in without a second thought at this first sign of provocation. After taking out the butlers that opposed them, Brutus asked Linton what he did to the manor. He claimed not to have tampered with the manor itself. He had no experience with workshops or engineering of any kind seeing himself as a sheltered child of the esteemed Edgar family. How would he have the capacity to do these modifications himself? He made a few investments with a few separate organisations. They did that for him. They were introduced to him as a group that was once part of the ring. Me. That finger was how it started for Virgilius. And this caught Ryushu's attention, as it did with Rodya. Remembering that the dead rabbits that they fought were affiliated with the ring, Heathcliff asked him what he was doing bringing them in. Linton didn't know. He never really cared about the details of how the manor was modified. 
Although, if his brother-in-law, Hindley, found out what he was doing, he'd have tried to kill him. He cared not, regardless. Ishmael asked how he even came across the Golden Bar, which Lyndon agreed that it's impossible for a private family to acquire it, but his family was a family of vast means. When his eldest brother left, most of the Edgar family fortune became his. He enjoyed the affluence, the only thing of his possession he liked. He spent most of it procuring the golden bar. Then he coughed, which reminded him that his health was in decline. It took him more effort to finish that sentence. Don Quixote recalled hearing of them in Fixer's Monthly. Heathcliff saw that he looked like he belonged in the infirmary. He then gave him a look that said, Don't f*** with me. You saw what I did to your butlers. And asked, What happened to Catherine? Lyndon saw this as insolent, asking if he really thinks that he even deserves to meddle in his family's affairs to meddle in that business between him and his wife? This he flip off. Honestly, does Lyndon want to die that badly? He told Lyndon now to talk like that to him, asking why he's trying to flaunt those words at him. Lyndon told him that they were married, plain and simple, lawfully, and they lived under the same roof, building a family together. Heathcliff was starting to lose patience. Lyndon believed that he'd never know what it would mean to be called husband, asking if he's wrong, asking who in their right mind would leave everything behind just to be with some poor backstreet vagrant like him. Heathcliff, under these circumstances, was being quite restrained, giving him another warning to stop provoking him. This had hurt him so much that he couldn't come up with a rebuttal, and this only emboldened Lyndon, who saw him as the first to leave her, seeing this as for the better, believing that she would have left him first if he didn't, because she would have grown tired of him. Heathcliff struggled to believe that. Then we have a flashback where Catherine was displeased by Lyndon saying something on purpose. Lyndon claimed to not know what she meant. He provoked Heathcliff so he'd anger him, so that he'd attack him first. Lyndon denied this statement by Catherine, claiming to have talked to Hindley, although he said that Heathcliff was laughable with his unkempt hair and the rags that he was wearing. This did nothing to lessen Catherine's anger, asking if he understood what he did. Hindley will thrash Heathcliff once Linton leaves, asking if he understood. Linton claimed not to, but it's more likely that he did and simply didn't care what happened to Heathcliff. Linton was crying, but these were likely crocodile tears, as this made Catherine tell him to quit weeping, as they're making her unhappy. The tears, specifically. Catherine understood that Lyndon tortured Heathcliff on purpose. Every time Hindley spoke ill of Heathcliff, he giggled with him, or agreed with him, as if he wanted Heathcliff to hear. Heathcliff would always attack Lyndon because he was an impulsive child. She asked why the people that she loved so much couldn't love each other. It's simple. Hindley was a spoiled brat. Lyndon was complicit in torturing those that are seen as lesser, and Heathcliff never got on with either of them. 
Later on, she asked if Lyndon loved her too. He said, of course. She is asking, how far was he willing to go for love? What does love mean for him? If he truly loves her, then perhaps he could bring Heathcliff back to her. Back in the present, Linton shouted about the diary, that Heathcliff could read it. Yes, this hit him harder than any harsh words that he ever said to Heathcliff with scornful and malicious intent. He looks downright pathetic as he struggles for breath, as he was unable to read the diary himself. His rapier dropped to the floor as all fight in him was gone. It was obvious to Heathcliff what was in there. When he tried to read it, it was full of nothing but ink stains on pages, asking why it refused him and not. Linton laughed at himself, believing that this was her answer. He didn't know if he had the right to stand in the way. He decided to go, well, get out of the way of them. He activated the button in the fireplace, something that Don Quixote saw coming, and the fireplace opened with the sound of mechanical parts. A long staircase leading downwards was before them. Linton had a hollow, dejected look on him. Nelly was concerned about him. Ishmael understood that the staircase led to the basement, asking what he was doing down there. All he could say was that he was preparing to invite a new guest, telling them to descend, whatever appears before them, whatever transpires. It shall be as Catherine will. All those years of tormenting and beating Heathcliff, due to seeing him as lesser than even a domestic dog, never mind an indentured servant, then continuing that torment when he returned after he had a reason where he was forced to come there. He married Heathcliff because he believed that she loved him, but in reality, at best, he was simply a backup, as if Heathcliff was still there. It's possible that she might have chosen him instead. Now, if this was a victory over Heathcliff, as far as Linton was concerned, it was a Pyrrhic victory. Because in the end, with all that torment, all that satisfaction from doing so, if not sadistic pleasure. I have to ask, Linton. Was it worth it? The basement clearly hides much. And the damned dozen will need to find out what. Until next time. Hail the rabbits! <laughs>